Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Chamber, it's great, it is my great honor and privilege to welcome the 44th President of the United States of America, President Barack Obama. Future. I think everyone here would enjoy an update on how your wife Michelle and your daughters are doing. They are, they are fabulous. I, uh, I basically, uh, you know, shine in their reflected glory. Uh, Michelle, as you may have heard, uh, wrote a book. Uh, it's doing okay. <laughs> Uh, she might be the most popular person on the planet. You know, she she is she is uh, she is a star, and rightfully so. Uh, and, and you know, it's interesting that the role of first lady is a, an odd role. Uh, it's it, it dates back to another time, and uh, I think people recognized her gifts in that role, but it was uh, one that. I think didn't give full measure of uh, all the things that uh, she has to say and all the things that she has to contribute. And, and so now I think she's got an extraordinary opportunity uh, to expand on that and she's doing wonderfully. Uh, my daughters are, are thriving. Um, I'm about to be an empty nester. Those are the parents in the audience who are going through that. I, uh, I weep often. <laughs> And I try to hide it. Uh, Michelle will elbow me in the ribs and say, stop it. Uh, and the girls will roll their eyes. Uh, but, uh, but they're, but they're both, both doing great. And, and it, it, one of the uh, things that Michelle and I are proudest of uh, 
uh, during our presidency is just that we raise young women who are kind and thoughtful and uh, aware and uh, want to make a contribution and uh, they're just good people. So I, I'm really, really proud of them. Fantastic. something you said, just obviously Michelle has got her book out, she's touring. We often talk about how the present, presidency changes the man. Um, from your point of view, how did being first lady change Michelle? Well, I, 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 another thing Michelle and I are proud of is the fact that I don't think we've changed that much. If, if you talk to our best friends, the people who are closest to us, um, they are struck by the fact that we are pretty much the same folks that we were entering into office. Um, although, she looks the same and I look much older. Uh, and, and, and how that happened, uh, it's not clear to me, but... Um, and and, and I, I attribute this in part to the fact that we came in after having lived normal lives for a very long time. Um, you know, uh, although I burst onto the national scene in the United States and then the international scene, uh, and it looked like I was being shot out of a rocket, uh, I was 43. I, had, I wasn't famous before then. We lived normal lives. We, uh, you know, we had a great life in Chicago, uh, but you know, we went to the grocery store and we got our car washed and we paid off student loans uh, from attending college and law school. And, and so as a consequence, I think we were not as impressed with ourselves as maybe some might have been uh, if, if this had happened to them uh, at, a, at a younger age. Um, and and I, I think that uh, helped us raise our kids well. Um, and, and it meant that when we left office, we didn't have this sudden uh, transition where we were shocked that people weren't paying attention to us somehow. Um, and, and, and I think that's a healthy thing. Um, we, Michelle and I have, have talked about this and we agree that what, what happens during the course of the presidency or uh, being first lady is that you become more of who you already were. Um, People, uh, I, I think because you, you have power and fame and attention and perhaps less constraints because the danger is that you're surrounded by people who uh, laugh at your jokes when they're not funny and, uh, and, 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 and uh, say yes sir, yes ma'am all the time, that uh, you, you start Losing some constraints, and and uh, I, I think if, if if you are relatively grounded to start with and uh, have have some modicum of, of common sense, uh, that reinforces itself. And if you don't, then that reinforces itself. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> I thought what we could do tonight to frame some of the questions and the dialogue is to. Use some photos. Okay. So if right. we could look at the first one. Let's see, where are they? Oh, uh, there you oh. go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Of course, this is a photo of your late mother and, and you. That is me. Now, how old are you there, do you think? Two, I'm maybe three? I'm, I'm probably three years old. That's, that's my bet. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly. Um, we didn't have, you know, those cameras with the dates on them and all that stuff back then. So. But it looks maybe three, three years old. You had, I think, what most people would describe as a pretty unique childhood. Uh, you were born in Honolulu. Yeah. You were raised by allegedly. A, 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 <laughs> yeah. Listen, if it if it means anything, I believe you. Uh, you actually, at, at a young age, also had a unique opportunity to go abroad and live in Indonesia for four years. Then you came back and... Did I, did I hear yeah, like an Indonesian cheer back there? It was like an Indonesian contingent. Did anybody catch that? 
kid. Oh, come on. Uh, you come back and you're raised by your grandparents before going off to college. How did those early years and those experiences, uh, as well as being raised by a single mother and your grandparents, shape you uh, and, and make you the man you are today? Well, you know, I, I, I've written about this. Uh, Hawaii uh, is an extraordinary place. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> I've got representation everywhere. Um, not, not only is it a beautiful place, but it, it uh, it's as close to America gets to an actual melting pot, uh, because you have people from all around the globe who somehow find themselves on this little jewel, uh, this, this uh, strand of jewels in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, and, and so it was a very loving and, and, and warm and wonderful environment to grow up in. Uh, as I point out, uh, as someone who was born to a Kenyan father, uh, a mother uh, from Kansas, uh, I'm in the middle of the Pacific, there aren't a lot of people that look like me. As I got older, and then when I lived in Southeast Asia for a time and moved back, by necessity, I think I learned to, to to be able to hang on to two ideas that seem contradictory, but that are not. And, and that is that uh, people are all the same, that wherever you go, people have common hopes and common dreams and common aspirations, similar struggles, uh, you know, color, ethnicity, uh, you know, nationality, they really are constructs that you scratch the surface and don't mean much and don't tell you much about anybody's particular character or, or um, inclinations. But at the same time, what you also learn uh, is that uh, in the here and now, uh, you know, issues of race and culture and nationality and tribe uh, have a great hold on people's minds. Uh, and, and so as, as a young person growing up in an environment that was multiracial and multicultural, but also not a lot of black folks, um, you know, I had to struggle with and, and figure out how, how do I have an identity that is uh, true to my overarching belief that we're all connected and, and we're all the same, but also that each of us are born into very particular circumstances, and racism is real, and sexism is real, and uh, suspicion between peoples who don't look like each other, or pray to the same God, those things are real. And uh, for a teenager, uh, that can be confusing, and so got myself into some trouble. Uh, but, uh, but came out of it on the other end, I think, in, a, in in a way that made me stronger and certainly contributed to not just my politics, but how I try to live my life. Excellent. Well, let, let me pick up on that because in your 2005 memoir, <laughs> Dreams from My Father, you described feeling isolated as an African-American living um, in Hawaii. And I want to quote something that you wrote in that book. I was trying to raise myself to be a black man in America and beyond the given of my appearance, no one around me seemed to know exactly what that meant. How did these early years shape your views on race uh, in society? Well, I, I, in some ways, you know, I, I, I gave you sort of a broader sense of how I think about it. Um, by the way, now there are a lot of black folks in Hawaii because uh, there are several military bases there. Black folks move there and they say, oh, it's really nice here, let's stay. And, uh, so it's easier to get a haircut if you're African American now in Hawaii than it was <laughs> back in 1970. Um, look, in the United States at least, uh, uh, race has been probably the uh, the most powerful uh, fault line in our politics. Um, it helped precipitate a civil war. Uh, 
it has shaped how we think about the role of government in society and the relationship between the federal government and state governments. Um, and, and so it is a very, very powerful force. And uh, in some ways it anticipates, or, or maybe a better way to say it is, it, it is uh, uh, in concentrated form an example of what I think we are now struggling with globally. Uh, you, you have a, a world that is uh, full of uncertainty because of globalization and technology and social media. And, and so people who used to be separate are now forced together. And uh, during times of uncertainty, people fall back on tribe and they fall back on what they're accustomed to and they're suspicious of change. And, and so in the same way that the United States has had to grapple with what does it mean to overcome a history of slavery and Jim Crow and how do we rebuild trust and how do we create a community that is, uh, that is based on people's character and allegiance to a creed rather than a bloodline, the world is now grappling with how do we create uh, a global community that uh, appreciates our differences and our unique cultures, but um, also recognizes what we have in common. Uh, and, and that's a difficult thing. And, and right now, I think what you're seeing is uh, the more ancient tribal suspicions come into the fore. Um, and, and some of that is because people feel scared and uncertain about the future. And, and, and I think all of us have, uh, uh, let me put it this way. Um, I think that racism in the United States uh, or, or racial suspicions um, are separate and apart from class and economic issues, but I also think that when there are strong economic pressures and people are scared and frightened and worried about their future or their children's future, uh, those baser impulses uh, have a tendency to, to flare up. Uh, and I think that we're seeing that uh, both in the United States and around the world right now. And as a father, um, what have what are those views or how have those views impacted how you've raised your two daughters? Well, one of the hopeful things is when you look at uh, Malia and Sasha's generation, they are so far ahead of us in sophistication, in appreciation of difference. Um, and it's not just along racial issues, uh, let's say issues of sexual orientation. I, Malia and Sasha cannot imagine treating somebody differently because of who they love. It, it doesn't occur to them in a way that um, makes you feel hopeful. Uh, and, and I think uh, th this is not just anecdotal. When you look at surveys, uh, younger people are, uh, are trying to get away from the baggage that us older folks hoist on them. Uh, and, and that makes me feel optimistic. Uh, I think what you see in the United States uh, and, and what you may see uh, in other parts of the world is that precisely because they've been raised to believe that of course I should be treated equally. You know, young people who take for granted that um, being black or being a woman or being Latino or uh, uh, part of an indigenous population is, is something to be proud of rather than a disadvantage. Uh, when they do see injustice and mistreatment, I think they're shocked in a way that older folks are. They're like, really? That still happens? And, and, um, and, and part of what you saw with the Black uh, Lives Matter movement and what you saw with the, the Parkland students after the shootings in the United States 
uh, in, in that high school uh, is more and more young people being activated uh, and, and, and saying, you taught us to believe something better than this. Uh, and, and we took you at your word and we're not going to stand for uh, the hypocrisy that gives lip service to the notion that everybody is equal or that everybody should be treated fairly or should, everybody should have economic opportunity or a decent education or that we're supposed to care for our environment. And then I, we see you old folks violating that every day. Um, and, and that, I think, is, is um, something to, to be excited about. It, it, it's, it's a reason to be hopeful. Let's go to our, our next photo, uh, which we'll put on the screen. This is a, a photo of you, Mr. President, actually at your second inauguration yes. uh, with Michelle. Got the bangs working. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was a whole thing for about a week. <laughs> Listen, before we talk about your second term in office, I want to go back to January 20th, 2009, uh, just a little more than 10 years ago when you uh, swore an oath to office for the first time, you were going to the presidency under very unique um, challenges and circumstances. The U.S. economy was on the verge of an economic collapse, and your country was fighting two wars, one in Afghanistan and the other in Iraq. What was going through your mind? Well, at that particular moment, what was going through my mind was, uh, it was really cold. And I was worried because there were like two million people who had been standing there for a very long time. And uh, I, I wanted to make sure that I got through the speech quickly enough that they could warm up. Um, but I, I, I entered a time of crisis. It wasn't just the United States economy that was being threatened. You, you had uh, a global economy at risk of unraveling. And, um, it, it, it's interesting I could, because I'm uh, at the tail end of writing my own book now, so I've had a chance to reflect on this a little bit. Um, in, in some ways, uh, I benefited from my youth in the sense that I wasn't as scared as I should have been. <laughs> and and uh, sort of had great confidence that if we just made a series of smart decisions that we could figure this out. Um, and, and as it turned out, um, we did make, make the right decisions. And by, I'd say, the fall of that first year, uh, the, the financial crisis was over, the markets were operating normally. Now, what you then had was, uh, in the same way that when a typhoon hits, uh, you have the immediate horror of, of uh, the wave, and then there, there's the devastation that's left behind. Uh, the economy had been wiped out uh, by the financial crisis, uh, and it took a very long time to climb out of that. Um, and that was a slog, and that was a struggle. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think what I, what I possessed coming in was uh, a belief that uh, sort of the old-fashioned enlightenment values of paying attention to facts and reason and logic and uh, <laughs> evidence, that those things, science, uh, that those things uh, applied and that you could solve problems. Uh, that sounds too easy. I know. It's shocking. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and we had a large enough majority coming into the office, and people were scared enough that despite already uh, a, a, a political dynamic that, of obstruction that we we're seeing from the Republican Party, we were able to just muscle through the things that needed to get done. Um, and and it's a reminder, I think, that uh, you know, at our best, what liberal democracies are able to do is to uh, 
take big, diverse, complicated societies and uh, through uh, expertise and debate and uh, compromise, uh, uh, we're, we're usually able to, to arrive at an approximation of uh, you know, an answer that, that serves uh, you know, the, the common good. And, and, and I think the danger that we have sometimes now in our politics, both in the United States, but I'm saying it internationally, is us being driven by uh, uh, passions that are disconnected from facts. Uh, that, that, in fact, deliberately uh, are shielded from facts and reason and logic. Uh, and what becomes important is uh, a story about us being right and them being wrong. And, and as a consequence, if we had a crisis today, uh, I, I'm concerned that we, uh, at least in the United States, that we may uh, not be in the, the habit of trying to uh, figure stuff out in a, in a common sense, practical way. <laughs> This is a, a serious issue in the United States. You know, you've had two years to reflect uh, on the presidency and, and government. Is there a solution? Is, is what's the what's going to be the big breakthrough that's going to create that bipartisanship that's out there today? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Look, every country's circumstance is different. But as I said, what you're, what you're seeing, one way I I think about what's happening now is, is that. Uh, let's say after World War II, after the defeat of fascism, um, you had a great contest of ideas, initially uh, between the West and uh, the Soviet bloc. Uh, you then had the end of the Cold War uh, and you know, that, those amazing images of young people climbing over and tearing down a wall, and then Mandela's released, and uh, China ends the cultural revolution and, and is entering into a market, uh, the, the, the global market, and it, there's this enormous sense of optimism, because there's a sense that um, liberal market-based democracies have won out, and that uh, now it's just a matter of technocrats figuring things out and uh, increasing GDP and expanding trade and uh, everybody's going to be okay. And I think in, in part what you're seeing right now is the failures of technocrats uh, and center left and center right governments in, uh, in liberal democracies uh, to take into account the fact that uh, inequality was increasing massively, that communities were being dislocated as a consequence of globalization, uh, that uh, the, the collision of cultures brought about by social media uh, threatened people's identities and made them uncertain and confused, and that in that disruptive space, demagogues and uh, tribalism and older stories about uh, us and them could reassert themselves. So I think the elections in the United States, Brexit, the, the rise of far-right parties in Europe, um, all are examples of that, but I also think that uh, to a large degree the, the extremism that you've seen in the Middle East and, and parts of uh, the Muslim world are expressions of that. Um, it, it is a fear and a rejection of this new thing that's being created. And so the solution, I, I suspect, is, 
and, and this is a generational project, not a, uh, a two-year or a four-year project, uh, is to figure out how we build on the strengths of liberal democracies, uh, how we are unapologetic about our belief in pluralism and uh, individual rights and free speech and uh, freedom of religion and non-discrimination, a, a whole set of principles that we fought for in fits and starts uh, to expand democracy's promise. Uh, how do we build on that but fix some things that were broken? Uh, how do we make an economy that works for everybody and not just some people? Uh, how do we provide people a, a greater sense of security in changing times? Um, how do we prepare this next generation, which as I said, I feel very promising about, uh, to, to be able to uh, lead a life at least as, as secure as their parents? How do we deal with the legacy of industrialization and climate change in a, in a way that is serious. If, if we tackle those things well, then I think that the polarization doesn't completely go away, but it subsides. Uh, now, the trick is how do we get from A to you know, Z? And um, <laughs> I didn't really hear what he said. You're, uh, you're north of the border now. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but, but one, one, one thing I've always had faith with is the belief that ultimately change is going to come from the people. Politicians rarely are in front of the pack. They typically run out in front of a parade that's already started. And if, if citizens insist on a better politics, if citizens insist on uh, integrity, if, if citizens insist on uh, facts, uh, and if citizens participate, that's how change happens. If they do not, then this isn't going to be solved be because suddenly, um, to take a U.S. example, uh, Mitch McConnell suddenly comes to his senses and says, you know what, I feel bad about not cooperating with Barack because actually he was pretty reasonable. And, and the Affordable Care Act wasn't a particularly radical proposition. It was just providing people health care using the existing market-based system. And, uh, that, that, that's not gonna... I don't think a light bulb is suddenly gonna flash. Uh, so it's, it's going to start from, from citizens demanding something different uh, as a